People make spaces through light. Light, it's so profound. It's so important that it sort of fades into the background. It plays a fundamental role in shaping our movements, shaping our habits, our practices. The social inequalities really show in the way in which we light certain spaces. Spaces are not equally accessed by the same kinds of groups at the same time. It's all about inequalities of how we regard and value different kinds of spaces. Light plays such a fundamental role for how we stage our social lives that we feel it's really worth talking about it. One of the problems with public discussion of lighting um, is it tends to be split. You get a lot of discussion of lighting technologies. You get a very psychological form of study in which people are talking about the impact of light on individuals. The other kind of study of light you get is basically aesthetic, where lighting is part of kind of place branding, marketing. What's missing between all of this is the fact that we're actually lighting socially inhabited spaces and socially meaningful spaces. We also look at how we can bring social knowledge together with some of those other kinds of knowledges. So for example, how can we bring together social research with forms of photography and representation? How do we understand the kind of semiotics of space? Because light and the study of light can lead us in almost any direction, it's one of our jobs to actually connect it with core social and political issues um, in clear ways. And inequality is an incredibly important and emerging agenda. Inequality does capture very different ways in which planners, policy makers, designers, um, developers might think about those spaces. We know that housing stock tends to be developed in particular ways and we have private developments where lighting might be considered as a, an, a feature of that space and we also have social housing where it may not have been. If we look at sort of wealthy neighbourhoods that have lots of heritage buildings, we see a very warm light coming from the windows spilling onto the street. Sometimes we even have gas lights. The lighting configures the space along sort of the paradigm of heritage about aesthetics, whereas if you look at other kinds of spaces, such as social housing estates, you can see that the lighting or the people who make the lighting configure the space along questions around control, uh, crime prevention uh, and policing. The difference between those lighting levels, between what we call prison yard lighting and atmospheric lighting, is the difference between seeing these, again, as kind of spaces of incipient public disorder or as someone's front door. In a way, the language of lighting is quite impoverished and we tend to think about too bright or too dark. But there's actually a whole spectrum of different features of light and lighting and different ways in which lighting plays a role in the kind of creation of that space and the atmosphere of that space. So what we're trying to do with the Roundtables project is to really kick off a conversation to bring this problem of inequalities in lighting to the intention of the people who make decisions about lighting for public spaces, especially in social housing. The current Roundtables were about trying to get people who often have almost nothing to do with lighting, but everything to do with social housing, <laughs> to think about lighting again in more complex ways. As urban planners, as policy makers, as designers, bringing them all together, it's a kind of uh, multidisciplinary set of experts around the table, thinking through all those issues and having a conversation that they might not ordinarily have. And each roundtable meeting has a different theme. And one of these themes is making connections, because light can actually contribute to spatial segregation, but it can also open up pathways and links. It can open up and estate through um, highlighting um, connections. And the Thames Meet Estate was a really interesting case study in that regard.
Thamesmead is a wonderful focus for research because it is a huge and incredibly complex space. It is itself a major exercise in modernist planning. Thamesmead was conceived in the 1960s to relieve London of its housing crisis and provide better and new housing. And it was really about articulating the new urban future. It was the new town and town was conceived as the town of the 21st century. Slowly but steady, there had been decline uh, on the Thamesmead estate and it has suffered really from neglect. I think the thing that stands out to anyone walking through Thamesmead, or, you know, encountering it at first, is just the amount of open space, of kind of diversified and different space, which allows people to do a lot of different things, and yet they're not doing it because it feels very empty. You just feel that lighting really could do something to kind of mark out spaces for gathering and for activities and so on. I think the Thamesmead is an example of how lighting comes quite low down the list when planners are thinking of the space and planning for the space. It really feels very dark. So what we have there is a particular kind of darkness. But that kind of darkness, in contrast to other kinds of darkness, is characterized by neglect. It has the whole gamut of different kinds of spaces you'd find on an estate. You know, the residential spaces, the kind of connecting spaces, lots of stairwells and corners. You've got open spaces, you've got plazas, you've got some green spaces, parks that you could think about in terms of use at night. The fascinating about the Thamesmead lighting is it was really relatively dim. It was also a little bit sporadic and more patchy in terms of light provision. You don't want bright spots and dark spots because that plays havoc with the eyes, it, it makes identification more difficult. One of the best things lighting can do for an area is increase the number of people that use it. The ambience that can be created, if it's going to draw people to an area, then I think that also can add as a, a crime prevention tool. Our lighting historically has sometimes been poor or um, has resulted in overlit areas. Now we want lighting to have a role to help make these spaces special and we're finding it difficult to do that. I've learned a lot around um, actually how lighting can be used positively and I think as well it's made me a lot more aware of how lighting is used in a negative sense. We don't always engage directly with the people who are making the decisions so it's important for me to get as wide a view as possible and to understand what the, the leading edge thinking is. Against the backdrop for example of new technologies that are coming up of course, LED technology, but also smart systems, more flexible systems that allow us to program a space. It would be interesting to think about the temporalities of movement and different communities of people using those spaces. Kids come out to play uh, in the public spaces of Thamesmead, which is something that I personally have never seen. So that's quite remarkable. And we do think that there's huge potential to reference these kinds of rhythms of social life. So I think in the case of Thamesmead, where there is, a, I believe, a significant issue about connectivity, whether it's, say, be boulevard through a park or a critical streetscape or whatever, or a place where we're going to encourage other activities, say, um, kiosks or commercial activity, a great opportunity there to create places to really emphasise these unique features which make it you know, quite extraordinary, actually. Modernism always has this reputation of, you know, it's always year zero. With Thamesmead, you've actually got a modernist design with a heritage. It's already got a long history. You can capture and use that history in design terms. We often talk about interdisciplinarity or, you know, this kind of thing, as if this is very easy and that just good intentions will do it. Um, and it doesn't. These are actually quite hard conversations because you get at a lot of the underlying assumptions, you know, that have, you know, kind of generate the way people talk about um, space. You know, how do the police see inequality? How do lighting designers see inequality? How do urban planners see inequality? And to get them to talk to each other brings out an awful lot of underlying assumptions, which do have to come to light if we're going to make any progress. And I think it's this mode of 
collaboration and co-production that really gets people on board. And it's very exciting that universities such as the LSE can go down that way and can explore what kind of new modes of collaboration are out there. The Roundtable has become a forum for thinking about it and I think it has already, I think, raised the profile of lighting. And I think Peabody, as an organisation, have now for a while been thinking about lighting and the, the priority of lighting has, has risen. It was quite low priority, but I think they now acknowledge that it, it is important and it's something they need to think about. And I think as a result of that, that space will hopefully be designed differently than it would have done had we not otherwise been engaged in a conversation.